Welcome to the Sisterhood of Sweat. I'm here today with Evan Stewart. Evan Stewart is a world-renowned life and business strategist with a mastery in building dominant, sustainable, and purpose-driven lives and businesses. Evan's unparalleled competence emerges from his experience building multiple seven and eight figure companies. His work alongside powerful influencers, professional athletes, high level executives and political leaders has helped shape the future of business and has had an impact around the globe. Through a unique blend of professional, personal and spiritual development, Evan Stewart is sought after for sound counsel regarding clarity, purpose, giftedness, calling, and obsession. In addition to his expertise in scaling companies and driving profits for small, mid-market, and corporate organizations, his proprietary training systems, ability to refine an individual's mission and message, and proficiency in honing the gifts and unique abilities of each of his private clients, are among the highest regarded tools his clients utilize to achieve their life and business goals. Simply put, Evan's work transcends cultural, physical, economic, and spiritual boundaries to stir the souls of the people and businesses with whom he works. As the founder and chief evangelist for Obsessed Academy, Evan helps others build a life they can be obsessed about through private events, hosting thousands of world changers at the Obsessed Conference, impacting lives on the Obsessed Podcast, speaking to the world's most forward-thinking companies and more. Wow, wow, wow. Do I have an episode for you today. This was so good. And so conversational. We were just talking about the times we're in and we just went from there. We talked a lot about resistance showing up in your life and how a lot of the times that it is just fear and how to get your feet wet, go from getting your feet just wet, starting small to taking big leaps in your life so that you can transcend uh, into a larger vision for yourself and others and inviting others on the journey with you which keeps you from getting burnt out being tired and exhausted but it also adds and grows your company and adds to their lives and their incomes this was oh, such a great conversation i enjoyed it so much i hope you guys enjoy it as much as i did and i just think that you'll get a lot out of it. We talk about purpose, we talk about your gifts, your calling. This goes along a lot with the podcast uh, that I had recently with Misty Sansom. So make sure you check that out. Uh, I feel like this must be the message for 2021, stepping into your vision and your calling and your greater purpose. Without further ado, let's dive into this episode with the one and only Evan Stewart. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Linda. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I know we, we shared some good conversation before the show, so I think we're going we're gonna to have a good time. So thank you for having me on. Yeah, actually, we were talking before this how we both have crazy noises going on. <laughs> <laughs> He's got construction. I have somebody filling in their pool next door. And, um, but he, he assured me he couldn't hear my noises and I can't hear his. So I think we're good to go. That's kind of the, the entire representation of this last year and then now, which is right when you have everything perfectly aligned, uh, not everything goes right. So, so I, if anything, it's just a beautiful metaphor uh, oh. for the catalyst for the whole conversation, I think. <laughs> oh, speaking of which, I, I was listening to my New Year's episode from last year. I like to go back and see what my goals were. Yeah, and yeah. I was like, oh, I reached all of them except for two and the okay. two that i did not reach were traveling one to go see my family and one to go to germany <laughs> yeah yeah traveling overseas was not exactly uh, easy to accomplish in 2020 unless you did it in the first quarter i suppose but 
I, uh, <laughs> I'm glad you accomplished everything else. That's incredible. Well, I think what helps is it, what doesn't help is going and watching the news too much mm -hmm. or being, I think, too invested in the political environment because right now it's volatile and i think if you can just focus on like if i just go outside in nature i'm like wow this is a great like this is a great day it's yeah. sunny today uh the grass is green the birds are singing it's when you are tuning into a lot of fear mongering or negativity that it seems like it can really distract you have you found it distracting at all you know, it's funny you say that word because the other day I got a lot of, uh, I should say, impassioned comments because I had posted this, this post where in so many words it said that there's a difference between being educated and being distracted, right? Where Trump is in the White House, get to work and focus. Biden's in the White House, get to work and focus. Where you should be educated and it's okay to take a stance and stand up for what you believe in, but don't be distracted. Because what's happening right now is, is a lot of individuals are leveraging the current chaos in the political climate as an excuse to be reactionary, to be emotional, to be distracted. And then, oh my gosh, I can't even focus. So therefore, now I have justification and reasoning and excuse for why my life, my work are, are not moving forward. And so it's funny you say that word because yes, it is distracting. You get in, get the info you need, get out. Okay, what's going on? I just have my picture and then get out. And, and maybe there are some people who, uh, your job is to dig in a little more, right? If you're in, in, in media or something, but for the vast majority of people, and this isn't, if, if you're listening, I know, Linda, you've got audiences, audience members all around the world, but, but if, regardless, not just America here in the US, but, but all around the world, there's a fine line between education and distraction. And so I think for me, it's, it's as soon, I, I go in with the exact amount of data that I need to extract, what's going on, what's happening, what are the timelines, et cetera. And then as soon as I have that, I exit, where I wanna be a consumer to a certain point, uh, <laughs> but those parameters are defined. So yes, I actually do agree with you. And I think it's pretty funny you mentioned that because you're kind of coming off the heels of, of some pretty impassioned uh, people that had, had, had commented on that post a couple of days ago. <laughs> people don't like it when you call them out, do they, Linda? <laughs> no, and I found myself getting, like, because I have been so good during this year yeah, to yeah. reach my goals, that, to not getting distracted. But I, I got to tell you, I felt very emotional after seeing what happened at the Capitol and mm -hmm. just the state of the union. It just feels like unrest, unstable, and we need stability right now, I mm -hmm. think, after going through this whole pandemic. And, and how do you find that? I think it's like learning to control the controllables, mm -hmm. you know, because we can't control what was going on. It was out of control, right? Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. couldn't control the pandemic. That's like out of control. The only thing we can control is what we do ourselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Each day. And you're right. And I think there's an interesting distinction there, which is um, oftentimes we forget that we have more control than we, than, than we actually realize. So, so in reality, like let's, let's take an example here of, um, you know, businesses all around the world shut down. The government shut down my business. No, you shut down your business. Just because you can't be in the office doesn't mean you can't adopt and figure things out. Right. And so not to be too blunt. And this is not a political statement for those of you that are listening that are getting triggered. I'm not, this is not some crazy, you know, you know, conspiracy. This is you made the decision to close. You made the decision not to pivot. You made the decision not to work. Now you have to bear the responsibility of going out of business. That's it. And so see, here's something that, that was interesting that happened in COVID. And I've got my hands in hundreds of different co companies all around the world in our community. So we have an immense amount of data. What COVID did was it pressed. It just pressed all around the world. And what happens is, is the consumer no longer had the energy or the finances, the emotional capacity to make decisions and figure things out. Is Linda's company good or bad? Is Evan's company good or bad? It was now, if you are not clearly, sustainably, and definitively an absolute must-have in my life, then you're probably not in my life. But the problem was, is a lot of companies tried to build this narrative after things had hit instead of the years prior becoming an essential business before there was declarations as to who and who may not be 
essential, right? We know how the conversations changed. It was like, oh my gosh, life is so hard, but you should still buy this car because life is better in this car. No, no, no. You should have been an essential part of that consumer's life beforehand by being present, relational over transactional, by ensuring that you can bring value without always trying to get in someone's wallet, right? I want to be in your life, not necessarily in your wallet. Those are different mentalities. And so many companies walked that fine line that when they made the decision to close the door, they complained about the bankruptcy. Well, the government didn't bankrupt. The COVID didn't bankrupt. You were winning so slowly that you were losing by default. And when you got sat on, you couldn't breathe. That's the reality here. And I'm not trying to get too deep into the weeds of of a relatively intense statement, but I want to cut a very fine line out of the gate, which is personal responsibility is everything. And so by starting with the, there are factors outside of my control, but my ability to control my actions within the uncontrollable is the start. And it all begins there. And we just came out of an environment where we see really two different narratives of the world is blowing up and I can't do a thing about it, or the world is blowing up. What should I do about it? And that produces, in my opinion, two pretty drastically different outcomes. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, for sure. And like what you're saying, if you weren't taking personal responsibility before the pandemic <laughs> and that now you're kind of almost, you're smacked in the face with it because <laughs> if you don't take some personal responsibility, you're going to be crushed. You have to really just like start saying, what can I do? Mm-hmm. How can I pivot? And if you have resistance, which I think sometimes a lot of us do, uh, you, you have to like say, why am I being so resistant? Why am I being mm-hmm. resistant to getting on a Zoom and doing things differently? Why am I being resistant to possibly writing a letter to my email list? Why am I, why am I sitting back and saying, oh, I, I don't like to write letters or whatever it might be. That for me, I for some reason did not mm-hmm. want to write a letter. Yep. I had no yep. problem zooming all over the place, but yep. I sat down and I was like, that, why was that so hard? That was mm-hmm. silly. Once I did it, I was like, oh my gosh. And once I sent text after text to my clients, you know, cause I have a fitness boutique. So of course, of we course. had to close. Once I started sending text and getting paragraphs back, I realized this is the way to go. It's connection all the but, way. But see, that's what you did right, right there is you said, okay, you're in the fitness world. There's, it's pretty hard to, unless you have apps and everything, it's pretty hard to be a gym and be open when gyms aren't, I mean, it's just, it, unless you just go, go far one side or the other and, and completely defy, if, if you want to be in the middle, it's pretty hard to stay open when things are closing down. And so, but, but that's an example of taking control and responsibility where you're present in your client's life and you're doing things. And I think the reason why people hesitate to do that is because really when you write a letter, you do an email, you do a Zoom, you start creating content, you do things differently, you're sticking your neck out there. And in right, I words, was putting you, myself out mm-hmm. there. You hit it right there. Yeah, how can you stomp on my neck if I don't put it out? And so what happens is you have these people that they lean back, but that, that right there is even a great example of, I reached out to my clients, I let them know we're present, we're navigating this, and we started to build the dialogue, not three months later, my God, I need a paycheck, you know, hey, do you, you still want to buy the, you st- that's, that's not the right way to go about that, in my opinion, you know? Yeah, yeah, and so I just, I really, I, I, uh, I don't know if you know Chris Winfield of Super Connector Media, but I'm in this group, Be Connected Collective, that was a lot to spit out, <laughs> but <laughs> it sounded great, yeah, a lot about being connected, and one of the things he said to me that really rang a bell is he said he used to be the most unconnected person mm. ever. And so he started wondering how he could be more connected. And so he built this whole brand surrounding that. And so knowing him and seeing him in action with all of us, all the value he gives, I would have never in a million years guessed this guy was ever unconnected to his clients or his friends or his family. So he tells his whole story and it really inspired me because I was like, okay, I, I need to stop resisting writing this. I mean, it was so silly. I don't resist anything else. I get up at the crack of dawn to teach boot camps and, yep. you know, I'm, I'm competing on stages, but I did not want to write a letter, which is it's putting always, yourself out there. It's always the little things, isn't it? And, and that's to, to 
you know, I mean, obviously you're in your success, you're a testament of this, of just a, a walking, living, breathing evangelist of this idea of just getting started and getting in motion. And it's funny you mentioned that because um, a couple of years ago, so, so when I was building my, my previous companies before now, I did much of it behind the scenes. It wasn't really good with posting on social or, I mean, sure, I'd post updates and whatnot, but I, I realistically built the company without a social media presence without really doing now, if I were to do it now, who things would be very different. I'd have a whole team. I'd, I'd fund a reality show. I'd do the whole thing and really go hard on the, on the social media. But what happened was is so as I'm exiting my real estate company and I'm starting to be called into different companies, environments, I'm doing some coaching and I'm just kind of transferring into what has now become our, our consulting firm. But at the time it was just speaking and working with people. There were calls for content. Hey, do you have any videos? Yeah. So one day I go, Linda, I'm going to make some content. And I, I don't even remember how many tries it took. I have my phone on this tripod. It was, it was atrocious. I, I don't, I, I might have to dig it up one day. I don't even know where, if I still have it, but I, I remember it being terrible. And even dur I was getting frustrated because I had started so late in the afternoon. Um, well, I mean, by the time the video actually came out, it was dark outside. So I have to I didn't have any lighting. So I had to change the lamps and everything. And it's ironic now, just a few years later, I mean, we produce hundreds of hours of content every single year. We, we produce tons that maybe even more than that. When you consider all the other audio, much of it's on camera, much of it's live, much of it. And, and all of that began by starting with the video. And that stemmed from an insecurity from, from me, which was, Again, how can you stomp on my neck if I don't stick it out? And what happened was, is I became more comfortable with the comfort of mediocrity than I did the, the discomfort of not actually reaching what I was working on achieving, reaching the goals and reaching that potential. And so that concept, just start, it's almost so simple that it's overlooked, right? But it's right. so powerful because no one says to start well, no one says to start perfectly. They say to start. And listen, this is the beautiful thing about this is you can immediately identify people in your network. Well, they're going to laugh at me. Well, you know what? They're not the right people for you then, right? <laughs> because the Bible teaches us not to be shy away from humble beginnings. And if the people in your network are, are discouraging you for getting started on something, hey, you know what? The other day I was in the gym and there was, there, uh, 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 there was this guy uh, that was working with, with a friend and, and he was saying, he's like, I, I kept hearing, he was, he was a relatively unfit individual. And, uh, and he, he was with his friend who was very, very fit. Like, wow. I was like, this guy's crazy built. And I kept hearing him say, Hey, it's day one. It doesn't matter. Cause he's lifting the five pound and, and he's just really at, at, at the bottom trying to figure out the gym and his friend, Hey, it's just day one. It doesn't matter. We're not looking at day one. We're looking at day 1000. I'm like, you know what? Everyone needs someone like that in their corner. And if the people in your network are trying to push you down for, for going after and doing a terrible job out of the gate, well, maybe they're not the people for you, right? <laughs> oh my gosh, you just are making me laugh so hard. So my two books back here, like I thought I was doing everything half-assed backwards, but I basically, <laughs> I started in a facility. Um, it was kind of like a, a big turf field and, mm -hmm. and uh, I had always coordinated aerobics and managed in gyms and all that and worked mm -hmm. it around. I have three kids, managed it around my family. Wow. And I was in this gym and I remember the day that he said he wasn't going to have any more private contractors. And that's what I was. I had built my business up in there and I was just like, oh my gosh, you know. And then I just, I went by this little tiny place and I started seeing the potential for what I could do. And I called it Chick Fit then, not Sisterhood of Sweat. That's and awesome. I started in this small little space and then down the street was an, a, a place I stumbled upon and I was like, that looks like a turf field. Mm -hmm. And it was in a church and it was huge. It was bigger than the place I was at before. And then I rent that space. I started down the street with my little uh, 1200 square foot building. And now, you know, I, I've written my books. I'm, you know, speaking, doing podcasts and uh, expanded my gym during COVID mm -hmm. to 3,800 square feet. Incredible. And so you That's start incredible. small, you start small, you, you, you know, people make fun of you sometimes. I had people making fun of my website, the first one I built, you know? Sure. 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 Well, well the, the people don't realize that the most resistance you're going to feel is at the beginning, which is why it's so hard to start yeah. because there's no data. You say, well, Linda, you're, you come to me. Oh, I'm going to start a gym. What? 
you're going to start a gym. Well, you've never done it before and you've never, because all the data that your life has presented so far, not you, Linda, but you metaphorically listener, that your life has presented up to this point is not that you've been successful in this arena. Well, I'm going to go and be an investor. Well, here's how many businesses fail, or I'm going to go and get fit. Well, here's how many people quit after the, you know, it, it's, it's uh, everyone usually stems from a place of love, but so many people want to give you the reality and the data, right? Which is, well, you better be careful. Don't get screwed. See, my thought process is I'd rather die on my own sword than succumb back to the sediment of mediocrity. And, and, and that's the concept is, is you have so much resistance at the beginning, but what happens is the things that worked against you are now the things that eventually are the things that actually propel you. So in my real estate company, oh, for example, yeah. I, I had no beard. I was much younger and no one wants to be a guinea pig, but I, I get it. It's like, oh, this child wants to come in and sell my property and whatnot. But then what happened was, is I start building momentum, building momentum over a couple of years. And all of a sudden, build a nice little multi-seven figure, start to break eight figures. Start, and I remember I started crossing that threshold of a 12 to $15 million business. And, and that was when, where at the time in my young 20s, running that big, all of a sudden the thing that worked against me was the thing that propelled me, which was the reason why people wanted to connect was because of my youth, not because the re, not, not my youth being the catalyst for the reason they went elsewhere. And then as it grew, and then as it grew, and then as it grew, I'm not saying this to be braggadocious. I'm saying this to be real and learning from experience that there's something in your life that's a chain that you think is holding you back when in reality, the chain can be holding you down and we just have to find ways to cut it through experience. It's not that you're held down forever. It's that that one little insecurity, the one reason why you don't send that text, the one reason why you don't send that email, right? That, that, that thing can be the catalyst for your entire future if you just have the confidence to recognize that what Jane or John Doe say right now in my startup phase has no relevance on me in a thousand days. And that type of confidence has to start at the beginning in order for you to get off your, your behind and actually go and make it happen. That's how the action begins, is just saying, I, I'll, I'll, I'll listen to them later and maybe later will come, but most often it doesn't. <laughs> oh gosh, for sure. I remember somebody making fun of the bathroom that I had telling me I needed to spend like <clears throat> tons of money to have uh, mirrors that make you look skinny and a, a bathroom that was, you know, like the Taj Mahal. And wow. I just started with what I had, right? Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. I want to invite him to my bathroom, but <laughs> I'm just mm -hmm. kidding. Yes. Now I would yes. Be like, is this better? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, do you accept the bathroom now? Yes. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. That's I mean, hilarious. yeah. And so I think it's just realizing that some of the things that you think really have to be there don't. Mm -hmm. And it really is about the connection. Like that's, to me for what I do. And mm -hmm. I think for most businesses, it's the connection with the people that matter that you're serving. And you have to get over the fact that you can't start out in, you know, the space that I like, I wouldn't have been ready for the space I'm in now, but mm -hmm. now I'm ready. I wasn't ready then. I was just kind of thinking about the idea and kind of going with it. Right. Mm -hmm. And really, what that guy did was a favor because I could have done that so long ago. I just didn't realize it. Well, I think there's a, there's an understanding that I believe in, which is you can be called before you're competent, right? Which is you have an understanding that you need, you're being pulled somewhere. You can do more, you can be more, you can build more, you're being pulled somewhere, but the competency is usually built in an environment and a season that looks nothing like what you envisioned. Right. And so an example of that, because that's essentially what happened, right? Where you said, I wasn't ready yet, but you're building your competency as you walk towards the calling. See, the interesting thing about the season of, of, of just discipline and obedience and as you're building competency, um, I was on a, a live show, I guess, last year. And it had an opportunity for people to call in. And, and we were specifically talking about uh, calling and competency and purpose and some of these more existential things. But I'd, I'd said that phrase, you can be called before you're competent. And, and, you know, my ideology is that if you expect to prosper where you're placed, you first have to take root where, where you're being planted and, and really dig in and, and full, uh, build a, a full understanding and obedience in that season before you can be competent elsewhere. And so I had a caller, all that to say, I had a caller come in and he says, well, basically you're full of it. I'm like, okay, I respect that. So, so let's, let's talk through that. And he said, I'm, I'm great in music. I, 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 
I, I love music. Like I, I know it's my calling. It's my gift. It's my, whatever it is, it is me through and through, but man, I know that's what I'm supposed to be doing, but I got a family to support. Right. So I'm supposed to be, I have all these great ideas, um, but no one's picked it up still supporting the family. And, uh, I'm just stuck being a cashier at Seven Eleven. So you're so bold to say that you can be called and that, but he's like, this has no relevance on the music industry. And I said, you're right. Being a cashier really doesn't have a lot of relevance, but I said being called before you're, uh, or, or build, building that, that competency. I said, what you're really doing is you're making thousands of tiny little micro interactions every single day. So in reality, as you're building that competency, what you can practice doing is you can practice making an impression in 30 seconds or less for people that have no relevancy on your future. So when you finally get to the club and you can finally meet the promoter and you can finally be in an environment, much like your 7-Eleven environment, where it's not built for those types of discussions, you have mastered the art of walking in, introducing yourself, making an impression and exiting in short time frames. So when your season finally comes to shift, you have the muscle memory from when you were being obedient where you are currently taking root. And I said, so in reality, it's not that they are similar. It's that the obedience you're building now is directly transferable to where we're going, to where you're going. And I say that to, to because Linda, you've gone through this, but, but especially your listening audience, you know, you've got such a diverse individual, a group of individuals that, that listen. It's, if you're listening to this and you're struggling with 2020 being a, a pretty disruptive year, right? We'll, we'll, we'll take, say that lightly. It was disruptive. 2021 is probably going to be pretty similar, right? We kicked it off with a literal bang and, uh, and it's going to be a, 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 an interesting year for sure. I can already guarantee it. Um, but also recognize that just because your current environment doesn't look like what you envisioned doesn't mean that you're not heading there because there are conceptual obediences that you can be building now, disciplines that you can be building now that are directly transferable. Right, Linda, with your, your bathroom story, well, you had a vision of what you wanted, but you're building the discipline of managing resources so one day you could comfortably grow into when there's nothing to prove, which means it's more authentic. And if you're listening to this and you feel stuck, just remember you can be called before you're competent. And usually we're called before we're competent, which means that now that season, 2021 for you may look like just building and work and discipline, like that individual at 7-Eleven. It could be three years before he meets the promoter but there's that season of working the muscle. And it sounds to me in your story that, that you've really gone through something similar. Yeah, we, we really, I mean, we started scrappy, but now we're debt free and we yeah, have really incredible. maximized like our income, you know, maybe later this year, I'll talk more about it right now. It's kind of <laughs> new and I'm sure, sort of like, sure. not sure, but uh, I, I think just what you were saying about the calling <clears throat> It, it really is, I mean, this, this for me really is a calling and a mission. And it, it started small and started getting, you know, just when I wrote my book, it, I was actually going through a little something and I had a, a little bit of a betrayal in my life. And it made me realize what kind of a, uh, a place I wanted to build and what kind of sisterhood I wanted to have. And so sometimes when you go through something, it may be rough, but it made me resilient and uh, it gave me grit. And also I, I have to say the sisterhood of sweat was formed out of that, you know, sweat stands for strong women empowering achieving together. And mm -hmm. that was a type of place you know, that I wanted to have where people supported each other. It felt like a safe place where they could be seen and heard. And, you know, this is what we have. And it's just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. And so you may start with something small, but if you start stepping out in that, in that little, you know, space, it'll, it'll start expanding. Mm -hmm. And I could have never seen myself where I am right now at the beginning but it's just having that faith and taking those steps mm -hmm. till you can see the final picture. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're exactly right. And I think, you know, what, what you did and what you described was you took a season of um, hardship and you were able to birth such incredible uh, opportunities to go back and pour into other people, maybe in a similar way that you wish you were poured into in that season, where you can take that and be the solution for, I don't want to be assumptive, I'm just thinking aloud, where, where you can be the solution for uh, other great individuals. And I think that's that's really 
that, that's so important. You know, there's all these conversations right now about personal growth and professional growth and all these ideologies about motivation and all that. You know, what's more motivating than anything is having your hand in the legitimate betterment of another individual's human being. I've never seen a room get darker because a candle lit another, right? I've never seen that. And so the, as, and you weren't quite going down that path, but I think that a common connection in a consumer's mind is like, oh, well, you know, motivation and success and achievement. Well, the problem is, is that they don't necessarily play well together unless you create an environment in which they, they can, like you did with the sisterhood. And oftentimes we, are, we have these disconnects between, well, I'm motivated, but I'm not successful. So therefore I'm demotivated and discouraged. And so we have these, these negative cycles. And in reality, even if you're, if you're listening to this, there, there could be someone in your life that's relying on your gift to be a, a, a blessing in their life. And there's someone in your life who you can legitimately help if you just got off the couch and worked. And going back to our first conversation about making it happen and taking the first step. Don't even think about for you for a second. Just think legitimately if, if your movement in this direction, even if you just make content and it can positively impact the life of another human being, or if you create the sisterhood like, like Linda and, and you build this big, this, this actual physical space, regardless, there are other people in the world that need to be blessed by your gift. And the reality is, if I can be so bold, I actually think it's selfish not to create. I do. Because that means that you're withholding an opportunity to bless the life of another person because of your fear. So for those of you that have maybe families, would you withhold an opportunity to give your child a better future just because you didn't want to? Think about it like that for a second. How, how selfish is that, right? That's pretty selfish. But it's a very similar mentality. There are people in your world, maybe people you haven't met yet, that you can only bless if you have a platform in which to bless not even financial. Mother Teresa blessed many. She was not very rich, right? If, if, if you withhold your ability to input something incredible into the world, be it a business, be it art, be it content, be it your voice, whatever it may be, then in reality, you're stealing a blessing from someone who really needs to hear it. Because at some point, if you're obedient enough in your work, you will positively impact the life of another human being. Assuming you don't put out you know, really terrible and abrasive content, obviously, but I know your audience doesn't do that. And so, but, but that would be my thought process there is it's, it almost becomes an issue of morality and ethics, not an issue of desire, which going back to the disconnect between success and motivation, now all of a sudden you're motivated because there's a connection there because I no longer want to feel a motivation to go out and do something. I now have an ethical and a moral commitment to do something because now I'm violating an opportunity to bless the life of another person. So by you not taking action and not taking the first step and not moving, it's no longer a question of, do you want to? It's now, are you a person that's willing to violate your moral or your ethical code for comfort? My answer is no. And that's a much harder answer. Uh, that's a much harder question to answer, much harder question to say yes to than just, do you want to do this? Yes or no? Well, maybe not. And there we go. And then, and then you're done. You see what I mean? So it's, it's almost building a habit into your life, an environment into your life, which forces a yes, whether you want to or not, which forces movement, whether you want to or not. And, and in so many words, I almost feel, Linda, that you did the same thing with your sisterhood of sweat, which is recognizing in so many words that you can benefit the life of a, another human being and, and taking the action to do so. So I think that's a really beautiful thing. I just realized this mission was a lot bigger than, than I, you know, it's a lot bigger than me, you know, and just realizing that as you're stepping into what you're called to do it really does help to push you forward in rough mm -hmm. times when maybe everything doesn't look like it's coming together the way that you dreamed. Mm -hmm. But if you hang in there and, and there will be a time where you do have to take a leap of faith. Oh yeah, that's coming <laughs> for sure. It's not an easy, it, not an easy road by any stretch of the imagination, you know, <laughs> I've taken several. Yes. <laughs> and yes, the indeed. last one was, it was going, adding on to our new space, adding more on, which we're in the middle of finishing right now. And that was a huge leap of faith during a pandemic, <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. but I just kept feeling the calling and it was just so mm -hmm. strong. And when you guys listen back to my other episodes, you'll, you'll hear the story about, uh, Sisterhood of Sweat and SOS and what it all stands for. But I, I'm really excited about the, you know, the Obsessed Academy. Tell us about that. 
Yeah, yeah. So I um kind of like what I've what I've touched on here. Um, I had a couple of different companies in entrepreneurial ventures, and even in middle school and high school, I had companies with employees and products, and I was just very entrepreneurial. And so I got into my my big pop, my big claim to fame, I guess. What I've referenced was uh, my real estate company, and we grew that uh, to be a relatively <laughs> large organization from zero to the top one percent of professionals in the state of Texas um, over about seven years from when I was, um, you know, 18, 19 to my, my mid twenties. And that was a really fun ride and an exciting experience. But what I noticed was that there were these people, great, great people that they were motivated. They were on board. They had great networks. They had all of the things, but they couldn't figure it out. It just, it wasn't fitting together. And I, and I started thinking, because I'm a data-driven person, I'm a logical person, as you can see, or I like to make connections. And I kept thinking, why are these great men and women not accomplishing? Why are they not? There's, there's something here. And what I found was there's this huge, inf- and for any of you that's in a startup or entrepreneurial, you, you already know this, right? You're going to laugh if you're smiling. If you're listening to this, you'll be smiling, I promise you. But, but it's the thought that there's all this motivation. There's all of this idea that, you know, you can just do it in sales tactics and you're going to learn how to close, but, but it's all kind of crap. And I don't mean to be negative, but, but it really is, right? You don't need to be motivated. Personal development goes out the window when bills come in the door. I don't care if you spend all day at the gym and go to a Tony Robbins event. If you come home to a stack of pink slips, it's going to go out the freaking window every single time, right? I don't believe in motivation as excitement. I believe in motivation as you can comfortably run a payroll and take a vacation. That's motivation, right? I believe in motivation as seeing your dream come to reality. So now you feel invigorated when you wake up and fulfilled when you come home. That's what I believe in. And so I see all of these people that are, that are, are, are they, they're just spinning their wheels, right? You don't need to learn a closing strategy. If I have to put a gun to your head to get your wallet, that's a robbery, not a close. <laughs> like, like, let's stop going through this ideology of here are all these tactics and techniques and ways to, and, and ways to, 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 no, no, the reality is this. It's possible to build a relational of a transactional business where a transaction, much like your sisterhood of sweat, where your transaction becomes a byproduct of a vested relationship, not the goal of the relationship. It's possible to build a business to make quite a bit of money and not be an ass and not lose your family in the process. Right? It's, it's, it's entirely possible to do that. Um, but usually those that have done it are either still doing it or you get someone that has just a little bit of success and then they put out all this content on what they did to get there and then you latch into it hoping that it's what you're looking for and it, it just keeps you, keeps you down because it doesn't work. So anyway, I connect all these data points and I look around, I say, okay, there's a need in the market for things that work. And so I had an opportunity to package and uh, a, a broker uh, here in the Dallas area. I'm, I'm in Dallas, Texas. I'm a Texas, Texas guy, uh, but a broker acquired my business and I made an exit and I started producing uh, and doing some consulting work and producing content as it relates to just the tactical strategies that we used to grow that company. And then now, of course, with, we've got hundreds of, of individuals all around the world that, that we work with that have worked in their companies as it relates to relational transactional relational over transactional business, to driving revenue, building relationships, establishing structures that don't break when the business scales, that type of thing. So taking our, our, our methodologies, protecting them from a proprietary standpoint, and then building them into uh, either individualized consulting that my wife and I do, or of course we have um, you know, 24-7 access on, on coursework and an incredible platform, incredibly engaging. And so in a nutshell, that's what we do at Obsessed Academy is we help individuals and companies grow profitably and realize their potential through our proprietary methods, which are, are built on data, not, not motivational seminars, but, but here's how you can plug something in and actually see results from it. Because again, there's nothing quite as motivational as results. Well, <laughs> right? I, I think too, you have to bring yourself daily motivation. Mm, it, it can't yeah, just be yeah. going to like one of my favorites, the school of greatness. I, I love going to the summit oh, yeah. Yeah. and you go and you're pumped up. And, but the thing is, is, is you need to learn how to put that more into your daily life as Mm -hmm. a, as a habit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Archelius says, um, we don't rise to the level of our expectations. We fall to the level of, well, his words where we fall to the level of our training, but it means we fall to the level of our habits, of our environment of, we're not going to rise to the expectation. Um, the reason why events are exciting 
uh, is because it's kind of a moment where you can have a meet of the expectation of the reality of the, I mean, it's, I, I love events. It's my favorite <laughs> thing to do. It, I, I, I do, but, but going back into your life, it's, it's like we talked about with, you know, the, the building competency, like we talked about, about the moral and the ethical obligation. It's building a framework of habits. So what you lean into, what you lean into is hot enough to keep you on fire and pushing forward, not to keep you pulling back into complacency. And that system is really hard, really hard to build. I, I think it's, people don't necessarily like accountability and more people are comfortable with, with just comfort, which is okay, but be real with yourself. If you only want to make $60,000 a year and you want to have a regular job and live a regular life, that's okay. Not everybody has to be this incredible entrepreneur, but if you want more, you have to know that you're going to sacrifice You have that. to take the leap. Like, that's yeah. exactly right. Like, when I got to that point where I'm, I'm like, you know, I was in my comfort zone again, mm -hmm. comfort, very comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I could have just remained there. It was like, not like I, you know, needed to, to go bigger. But it was the vision that pushed me forward. And, mm -hmm. and I think just realizing that, do you want to be just in that comfort zone? Or do you want more? Mm -hmm. Right. And that, that's it. And yeah. again, that's an easy question. What's important to you? And once so, you answer that, you can answer that. <laughs> so how do you, how do you help people to live an obsessed life? Mm. Yeah. So there's a couple of different ways that we go about that. So I believe that building a life you can be obsessed about is not this existential ideology where you wake up and you feel good all the time. I mean, that's not life. Um, if you felt good all through 2020, you're odd. <laughs> so like, that's not real life. Um, but what I believe is that when you live a life that you can be obsessed about, you're living in what I call the cycle of healthy obsession, because the word kind of has negative connotations, doesn't it? it, it, it people think of um, addiction, or they think of, of, if there's someone who's obsessed on the news, it's probably not a good news story, right? And so there's a negative obsession, which is what a lot of people think of. But, but what I noticed is that most people that are achieving really, really incredible things are obsessed and all consuming passion on one thing. And so simply, I believe that obsession is a cycle, a three-part cycle where it's an emotion, it's a mindset, and it's a discipline. I believe that it starts with an emotion, which for my recommendation is a stage of revelation. It's not the sky opening up. It's like, I mean, you, you've gone through this, Linda. It's, it's, it's a pulling. Hey, exactly. You can do more. Exactly. Hey, you should be over here, right? It's a little pulling. It's you coming home and maybe talking to a, a spouse or a partner and saying, I don't think I should be in this cubicle anymore. That's, that's that revelation. And see, then the next thing is it starts with emotion, which is the stage of revelation. And then it goes to a mindset, which is the stage of preparation. That's where you can be called before you're competent. Revelation, I know I'm called now. I have to build my competency, right? If you expect to prosper where you're placed, you first have to take root where, where you've been planted. And so that that is in reality, that season where you're building the obedience, it's when you're planting seeds, it's when you're growing, growing, growing. It's the first three years of business. It's your first gym with the weird bathroom. It's the, it's the everything that you start with the humble beginnings. I'll say, I'll say the crappy bathroom. Okay. okay the crappy, but I'm not going to say it. I didn't see it, but, but, but it, it's, it's the humble beginnings, right? So it's an emotion, which is revelation and it's a mindset, which is preparation. And then it's a discipline, which is cultivation. And so what happens as we've been working our land is we're placed in an environment where we can pluck. And see, the interesting thing about like a fruit tree, for example, is when you pluck, the first year doesn't produce, second year doesn't really produce, third year produces just a little bit, just enough for you to recognize that the literal fruits of your labor are in there somewhere. And the reason why it's a cycle is because obsession, what happens when you can do it, you pluck. And then you think, I can do more. I know I can do this again. I can do it faster. I can do it more profitably. I have a bigger vision. That's just a revelation. And then what happens is you go to work on the revelation. Now you're back into a season of discipline. So it's an emotion, a mindset, a discipline. It starts with an emotion, uh, which, you know, the, the revelation, and then it kicks off everything. So that's the cycle of obsession. So how we help people get obsessed is twofold. A, when my wife and I work with individuals, we'll sit down and a lot of times it's this connection. Hey, what do you do with little effort that requires much effort for other people? How do we reconnect you with that purpose and that calling? Not in an existential way, but a tactical way, right? We work with a lot of people that have done it. They're really They don't need any more money. They don't need a bigger business, but they don't know why, what, they, what to do next. Okay, how do we reconnect you with the things that inspire, fascinate, and motivate you so you can live a more fulfilling life in a tactical way? And then build a structural framework to where you touch it every day. 
to where you no longer have to justify to your wife that you're doing it for her when you're not present because you can finally be present when you come home, that type of thing. So how do we get you connected there? And then the second component on the lower end, so I'm talking about individuals that are getting, not lower end in humanity, but lower end in time, individuals that are getting started, individuals that are beginning to work is if you're going, professionally speaking, if you're going to be starting a company, we get you connected with the mission and the culture and, and all of the things that it takes to actually build a sustainable business. I don't want get rich quick. I want get rich certainly, sustainably, and forever. And I want a business that's not going to die when I do, right? So how do we build something? That is where it begins because most people, the most beautiful iteration of their labor is through their work. So if you can wake up invigorated and come home fulfilled and not have to be drained by your work every day, well, that leads you to be reconnected with purpose and actually build a life you can be obsessed about, that all-consuming passion. So we can either enter through the business or enter on the back end through the purpose. But in so many words, I know kind of a long run around a short walk type of answer. That's, that's how we work with, with companies around the world to, to build, a, I guess, as you would say, a more obsessed life. And it, it sure, is, sure is an interesting line of work. You get to meet a lot of great people. <laughs> Well, now it's interesting that you said that because now I can see some of the things that I used to do kicking in in my thought process where I used to train hundreds of instructors how to, you know, teach or personal train or whatever. And I'm like in the gym and I've got some people teaching, but I was watching a couple other girls that I've had for a while and I'm like, mm hmm, yeah. I think she could do Monday, Wednesday, right? She could, yep. I think she could do this. I think she could do that. I need to plug them in because then I, I am growing my vision because what's going to happen is that's going to elate their lives. And then they're going to bring people in and then I can pull back a little bit from mm -hmm. and, and watch the business roll. It doesn't have to be uh, just me anymore. Yes. And, and you're, and you're right. I mean, Self-employment is not business ownership. And I like saying that. I get a lot of crap from that, but, but just hear me out. If you're reacting negatively to that as a listener, then, then just breathe for a second because I'm not attacking you. What I'm saying is, is self-employment is not business ownership because a business is not just someone who can labor and earn. A business is a structure that can right. earn without you always having to be behind the wheel. I was just like, oh, my exact mm -hmm. thoughts today were, I was just like, okay, I think it's time to jump more into that where I'm here and, and the business could work without me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's the definition of a true business, right? If yeah. you still feel guilty because you want a vacation with your family, I don't know, maybe that's not a, there, there could be many other factors involved, but from a business standpoint, uh, a business is not one where your entire life has to become uh, subordinate to the needs of this metaphorical organization, right? And in reality, the organization should be structured around what, what you need in your life. And so uh, we just, we tend to get it wrong, but yeah, that's an interesting perspective for sure. And, and, and I have to say too, watching all of my other girls and it's like watching them with everybody. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. Like I, I'm not needed to be here all the time. This, this mm -hmm. is great. This is, mm -hmm. this is going to be a sustainable vision if I step into it this way versus a burnt out, exhausted entrepreneur, the other way is yeah. letting go. And I, I also went to, um, I think it was uh, Kayla Craft. Uh, I think she called it Mommy Millionaire. And um, yeah, yeah. Um, Chris Harder was speaking. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how when Lori had a gym, she had to learn to let her ego get out of the way, which it can happen where you're used to being the one, right? Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah. it, it oh, really yeah. spoke to me about letting letting go of, of thinking I have to be the one, I have to be the one doing it all. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm 58, I'm, I'm getting a little older. <laughs> so well, I'm, <laughs> I, well, don't, I think that that mindset typically is not even, maybe there's some ego there, which I think, look, it's great to take pride in things that, that we build, right? Of course. I mean, it's like an artist. Why would you not want to be a one that produces art? But I think in the same breath, it's also sometimes an, an insecurity of, I have yet to find someone who can maintain my standards of quality and communication and efficiency and workflow. And so instead of continuing to beat my head against this wall as no one, I can't seemingly can't find you anyone. You just end up doing it all yourself. I'm do it myself, right? And 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 you look, look, I'm hiring again for my companies. Um, 
good gosh, I cannot tell you how many people we've gone through just, just for a sales position. Well, well, because we're maintaining our standards, but every single no, we say we got, we got to keep, got to keep at it, got to keep at it because eventually, you know, you plug in more people, it, it reinforces that insulation, which is you're not the technician, you're a business owner, not a business worker. We need to go right. from technician to executive. And so it's not sustainable. Right. It's no, not no, no, sustainable it's not. because what's going to end up happening if you are passionate about what you're doing, people are going to want more and more of that. Mm -hmm. And there's less and less of you and you only have so much energy. And so mm -hmm. at the end of the day, do you want to be just tired and exhausted and not enjoying what you love? So I think you have to bite the bullet. You have to invite people in and start letting them be a big part. And they may not show up pretty at first. They may not show up the way you want them to at first, but just realize that there is a space and a place for them and you have to be somewhat patient, I think. I think so. You definitely do. It's just, you know, using every every moment, every day as a catalyst for something greater. And, and so recognizing that, hey, maybe this season I'm in isn't completely sustained. Look, it's necessary. Like, it's necessary, but it's you know, not going to be sustainable long term. Yeah, just but maybe you, not you, for you. 40 years, you know. <laughs> Because after a while, you're going to be like needing some help. <laughs> yeah. After a while, should things grow, right? After a while, you're going to definitely be needing some help. So you're, you're hit the nail right on the head. And, and then some of the, the other things that Chris said that I really wholeheartedly believe, and I've seen them in my own life in action, mm -hmm. is as soon as I hire somebody, like I hired assistants that are virtual, I have a lot, I have, I did that first. Uh, they, you know, do the editing of the podcast, they do the show notes, they do the graphics, they do all these things. Mm -hmm. you, you end up making your product better, making money on the other end. Mm -hmm. it's, it, every time I've ever hired somebody to help me with something, I always made that money back. Or if I invested like in, in doing a, you know, school or a webinar mm -hmm. or being part of a mastermind, whenever you elevate yourself in that way it elevates you all the way across the board and so a lot of times we think oh i can't afford to hire that person because i'm you know low budget small business but i'm telling you as soon and chris says this too as soon as you start adding them is when you start expanding that's when you mm -hmm. start to grow is because you 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 automatically begin growing by letting other people in well, you free up your time to do what's productive and important. And if nothing else, there's nothing. I remember my first in-house people, not, not virtual, but the, you walk into that office and all of a sudden there's a face of a person who you're responsible for. It's like, I, I mean, I don't have, I haven't been, been blessed with children yet, but um, I can imagine as a parent, right? It's, 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 it's literally a similar mentality of, wait, I'm responsible for this person, the way they're providing for their families. It, it truly, and, and through, through your, your environment and your culture and your compensation, and if nothing else, that's, a, that's motivation. That's like, another yeah, thing that you're giving. I'll start a little later, but that employee is going to be there at 6.30. Do you really want your new person getting there before you? You know what I mean? And so it, it's this motivation to, if nothing else, it just kicks you into gear. <laughs> <laughs> There's that too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, sure. somebody comes along and does it better than you. <laughs> maybe, maybe they weren't, you know, the other end of the spectrum is sure. they, they set the bar a little higher or they have a other knowledge that you don't have and don't have the time to go get. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. No, you're exactly right. So good. So good. Tell us about your virtual event. Uh, well, you, you, you aren't having a virtual event. Tell us about your conference. Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, the, um, for those that are listening, we host a, a big event every year, well, except for 2020, called the Obsessed Conference. And so what we're doing is in April, April 29th in Dallas, Texas, we're hosting a beautiful event. Um, we still have distancing and measures in place, but it is in person. It's a 50,000 foot venue at an old bomb factory. It's so cool. Uh, we have an incredible space, but uh, answering the market question, the reason why, you know, we had gotten into the business, it's the same answer, just a different avenue of we're putting people on the stage that aren't just motivational, but people that have literally built sustainable lives and businesses. So, okay. So this individual that scaled and exited three companies, some of them being multi $500 million organizations, uh, those same principles can apply when you're a $200,000 company. 
this individual who is able to work with some of the most powerful people in the world, what has he learned working with some of the most powerful people that I can apply now? So, so really tactical, uh, just not motivational, but, but just deep, important content. So we do that every year. This year's concept, the source, identifying the source of your obsession and building a profitable and sustainable model around that thing that you find inspiring, fascinating, and motivating. Uh, we do have some virtual events that are really our add-on and our, our, our give to uh, ticket holders because we were supposed to be, we were supposed to have this event in October of last year and well, COVID. So uh, instead, what we did was we, we put together a couple of incredibly high quality virtual productions that happened last year. Our next one's in February. It just as our way of saying thank you to the ticket holders. Thank you for your patience and allowing us to, to extend. And so um, if you really believe that you can get in an environment of, of people that are just interconnected in a powerful way, running in the same mission. And more importantly, if you're tired of getting freaking pitched to all the time, all these conferences where it's like, oh my gosh, here's my keynote and it gets you all hype and then buy my stuff. It's not a pitch fest. I only put people on the stage that have done it. You can't sell me to get on the stage. It, we, we don't sell from stage necessarily. And so it's a, really the goal is just to have you come as you are, but, but leave transformed and have a clearer identity on the source of what you find inspiring, fascinating, motivating, a better network, great connections, et cetera. Um, yeah, if that's something that, that you're, you're listening to this and you think that's, that's pretty interesting, then you can just check us out at obsessedconference.com. Uh, we still have tickets available, which is exciting. Uh, the next virtual event is in February. So um, anyone that, that gets connected before then will get access to that as, event as well. And it is probably the most fun project that I do every year. There's nothing quite like getting a bunch of really motivated, powerful people in a room together and then watch the interplay happen. It's a really beautiful thing, actually. <laughs> where, where can everybody reach you on social media? So all my stuff is at real Evan Stewart. Stewart is S-T-E-W-A-R-T. And all of my platforms are at Real Evan Stewart, but I'm most active right now on Instagram. I kind of took a hiatus from social media for a while, just as we focused on our work. But yeah, you can find me. You can slide into my DMs. My conversations are open and uh, I'm always up for some good connections. And what, what are three simple tips for everybody out there to live a purpose-driven, obsessed life? Mm, three simple tips. That's a great question and a slightly loaded question. I love it. Um, I would say the first one is, is that your ability to live a life that is fulfilling and impactful only extends as far as your ability to communicate. And part of that is it begins at the home at your table and it extends into your workplace and it extends into the public. Um, I've never seen an individual that has an incredibly healthy relationship with another individual that doesn't have healthy relationships in the workplace, vice versa. So the first thing is you need to learn your ability to communicate. The Five Love Languages is a fantastic book start at home, goes into the workplace. Learn how people give and receive importance, affection, care. Um, I think that's important. Uh, the second thing is um, I fundamentally believe that power and strength comes not in aggression, but comes from loving the person in front of you. And I, in the same breath, right, it is more important to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. I do believe that. Um, but just like you went through, Linda, as you're developing your mental grit, you have to learn to fight for what you want to keep. And yet, a ability to be in control and an ability to move in a loving and forgiving and compassionate way, right? Kindness does not mean weakness, but um, the second most important thing that I would say is that loving the person in front of you is the most powerful way to free to practice strength every single day. And it exudes more strength than being aggressive, regardless of whether it's uh, justified or not. Um, the third thing, honestly, I mean, gosh, I, I wish it was more complicated, but do the work. And every single time that you have an up or a down, dig into the data. So in a very short explanation, let's say that, and I'm talking specifically more professionally here. Let's say that you have a really good month. You do a million dollars in sales. The next month is really bad. What happens is a lot of people, they'll skew their business model to the good or in away from the bad. Oh my gosh, I had a great month this month. Well, it just could happen that a bunch of stuff fell on the same month. And so in reality, you start to skew. Well, we need to do more of this, more of this, more of this, more of this. And what happens is you bend away the median where the bulk of the meat of the business is. And so if you're an individual that's trying to create something in 2021, what I would recommend is um, gather your data as much as possible once a week, definitely, definitely once a month or more. Gather your data as much as possible. And what we're looking for is the middle. We're looking for that middle margin. I don't want to skew too far towards 
or away from the big ups and the downs. And that's how you build something sustainable, which is if you can build a model that continues to support, sustain, and attract that middle 80, 85, 90% of individuals, then as that grows, the SKUs will continue to grow as well. Uh, hopefully not down, but continue to grow as well. Um, but if you try to always build and shift the model towards the things that happen to pop in a moment, because you will all, regardless of your experience, you'll have a, a moment in your business where things just pop. And it just, it just kind of happens. Things fall on the same day. Great people come in. There's a, a podcast that you're on and it just has a, a, it goes viral. Things just pop, but, but changing your entire model towards the pop is not a, a sustainable way to do business. And so I know it's kind of all, all over the place, but the ideology of, of loving the person in front of you, of, of really shifting that model. And then honestly, just a lot of the stuff that we talked about of care and compassion and communication. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of good, good nuggets in there that we can leave the audience with. can't believe my phone just rang. <laughs> that was so good, Evan. <laughs> this has been great today. So many nuggets today. And I hope everybody out there listening was able to absorb everything that you were laying down today. So, so good. And also, uh, you have a new podcast coming out, right? We do. Yes, we do. So um, we are going to be launching that in February. So I don't have an exact date yet, but uh, my wife will be joining, which I'm excited about um, because my last podcast, it was very me and business. And so, no, 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 we're getting into the meat of real conversations. Like, what happens if you have a fight with your spouse in the morning and you go to work? How do you communicate? I mean, I'm talking about like, real con and it's not all real, real talk You're like real, real real stuff. talk like like real talk like let's get into the meat of it like it, yeah what happens when we have differences in political ideologies and economic ideologies and let's get into the meat of real conversation and so um realistically the best place for people to connect with that would just be uh follow us on instagram at real evan stewart my wife is, is the britney stewart because we'll be announcing there the exact date is to be determined because we're, we're putting it together we're really excited we've got some amazing guests we've got some amazing conversation but we're gonna we're gonna do it right so Perfect. that'll launch sometime in february and uh, i know we'll have to loop back around and make sure that you, you get connected on that for sure well thank you so much and I appreciate you coming on and you so knowledgeable and so such a fun conversationalist, I have to say. Thanks. So <laughs> I want to thank everybody for listening and please let us know what you liked about this episode. Thanks everybody.